audience. Um, Pam Berry is my co presenter and she will be calling in to participate in this and Pam practices um, in Hood River. So she comes to us with a perspective of working in a small rural setting uh, where the resources are a little bit different than what we might have in um, our bigger, more urban areas. Um, we also earlier this morning, we're talking about how the opening keynote really set the stage for what we want to talk about today, which is thinking about how do we um, offer de-escalation techniques in a medical setting when it's needed. And so some of the things that the opening keynote speaker shared will, will be, I think, uh, reinforced in, in our talk. Uh, neither of us have anything to disclose. Uh, and our objective is to try to take a look at why people are upset with the healthcare system these days, which is a great big topic, to try to talk a little bit about practical approaches to de-escalating encounters um, and to help participants identify strategies for de-escalating tense clinical encounters. And I, I want to begin by saying that no one size fits all uh, in these situations. And as our opening speaker talked about, there are so many different scenarios that present themselves in healthcare settings um, that are, are sometimes complex to really tease out. And I really appreciated the opening speakers comments about really trying to um, for the most part eliminate bias or or assumptions um, before we have all of, of the information that uh, is needed in some of these situations so we're going to talk through some of this um, giving you a little bit of data about what's happening in the healthcare system Pam has a pretty profound um, case that she's going to talk about and then hopefully we'll have time to have some discussion so one of the sobering things that we know is that violence in the workplace has really escalated. Um, can I ask, can I, it sounds like somebody's doing the dishes. <laughs> Wondering if you might be willing to put it on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, healthcare workers are five times more likely to experience violence than other first responders. This is relatively new data. This did not used to be the case. Um, and unfortunately, there's been a 40% increase in violent incidents from patients toward healthcare workers in the last five years. Too many, it's it's kind of the perfect storm. And I listened to an interview who by Karen Coughlin, who's the director of the Massachusetts Nursing Association. It was an interview on PBS <clears throat> in which she said, it's too many patients. We cannot provide all the care that we want. And to date, there are very few consequences uh, when violence does uh, happen or, or behaviors uh, get elevated. And as our, our speaker this morning talked about, our health systems are tr still trying to figure out what's an appropriate response in some of these situations. There was a three-year study in the uh, Journal of Nursing that noted that 25% of nurses reported being assaulted by patients or family members. And while this has been true to some extent in emergency departments and psychiatric units, you know, over the years, um, the prevalence of it in across all, all healthcare settings and toward all healthcare workers has certainly elevated in recent years. The uh, Center for Disease Control had a report that talked about the fact that the initial and persisting impact of COVID continues to threaten our healthcare workers' mental health and propensity for job burnout. Um, and that that was a, a, a something that they studied prior to the pandemic, and they concluded that about 50% of the healthcare workforce was experiencing burnout and, and compassion fatigue, and that was before the pandemic, and since then, the numbers have really elevated, and we've certainly um, said, we found in this particular study that 40% of healthcare workers were concerned about the threat of an active assailant, and, and more than 50% voiced personal safety as a top priority in order to continue to work in health. Healthcare, um, and we've heard this in our own setting that that many um, uh, units have asked to have panic button technology and units and customized tests and phone alerts to um, via safety app to try to ensure the safety. Of Everybody okay? Wow. <laughs> 
so sorry. There was callers waiting to be let in and I let someone in and that was the noise it was making. Okay. But we should be good. I've muted whoever it was. <laughs> Pam, are we out there? Are you out there? <laughs> Is Pam able to speak? Uh, she should be unless she's muted i'm asking which caller she is it just says call in user number okay. okay so i am working on that thank you samantha appreciate it okay so um this kind of fits that noise we just heard <laughs> these expressions um why why are patients more upset um i think any one of us can name a lot of reasons that patients are upset in part, I think, and one of my staff members made mention of this in a staff meeting, that many people, I think, are still experiencing um, a lot of moral distress as a result of what happened during the pandemic. And certainly, all we have to do is get on the highway to see how on edge people are post-pandemic in these very complex political times. And especially since the pandemic, we've seen a, a huge rise in misinformation and in general mistrust of the healthcare system. Um, and it's been kind of the, the perfect storm, you know, navigating healthcare systems uh, are, are very complex. Uh, we've become pretty depersonalized and the number of times I've heard in the last year about wait times to access medical appointments and how hard it is to uh, feel like you have a, a a close relationship with your healthcare providers. The time seems short just, and, and providers seem distracted and, and uh, on edge themselves. And that we, a lot of us have talked about the scarcity mentality that has, has occurred in terms of scarcity of staffing, time and, and resources, all the while experiencing high patient acuity as well. Hospitals are at capacity. We certainly experienced that during the pandemic and using OHSU's emergency department as an example, we often have, in addition to people waiting to be seen in the ED, a, a whole group of what we call boarders, which are people who need to be hospitalized, but are waiting for a bed to open up to become available. Um, and care is being provided in really overwhelming circumstances. There's a lack of privacy or space. Uh, we had a recent Schwartz round where, where our ED workers talked a lot about having to provide the very best care that they can, but under less than ideal circumstances because of things like lack of privacy, lack of space uh, in so, so many patients. So we have the perfect storm. We have an exhausted workforce. Uh, as I mentioned, the um, National Academy's press uh, focused on burnout in healthcare and concluded that about half of us were burned out, and that was in 2019. But we know the impact of exhaustion and fatigue that can learn to lead to burnout, demoralization, apathy, and indifference. And all of this can lead to people leaving the field or feeling like they are offering compromised patient care. So our challenge is, is kind of multi-layered and our, our keynote speaker spoke to this a bit. In general, we are not trauma informed. And so, you know, we, we find that some of our patients come to us with long histories of trauma and may experience medical care uh, in a way that re-traumatizes them and they may go into a state of fight light or freeze. Um, and that can result in behaviors that, that might be somewhat disruptive. We also know that healthcare systems tend to be very rigid and very hard to navigate. Another thing that, that I'm in meetings about pretty regularly is what actually constitutes a threat, and our keynote speaker talked about that, uh, versus what's a difficult behavior that's related to trauma, mental health issues, or other circumstances. And as we know, different systems have different resources available to help. So people in small rural hospitals may not have the ability to have a lot of others to call upon to help navigate complex patient care situations. And Pam is going to talk about that in her in her um, setting. I'm working on it. I just okay. I'm sending out an email a second right now. Thank you, Dave. Um, we also know that 
emotions run high in some of these disruptive situations. Um, and we know that fear is often uh, underneath what's happening. And, and people who come to us with a lot of anger, often what's underneath that is either fear or sadness. Um, and yet, when people come toward us with a great deal of anger, you know, our, our reactivity becomes high as well and we become dysregulated. I was just in a situation earlier this morning with a patient who was really, really, really angry and um, people were, were concerned about, you know, what was the level of threat versus, you know, an a, a expression of, of real um, anxiety and, and fear and mistrust in the healthcare system. So part of our challenge, I think, as healthcare providers um, is to balance the safety of patients and families with the safety of healthcare workers. And our keynote speaker really, I thought, highlighted that beautifully. Can we have both? Is it possible? I would say yes, and it's necessary, but it isn't always easy to achieve that. So with that, I'm going to put myself on mute and go over to Pam if she's able to join us by phone. So I'm going to guess that Pam was muted because people got muted when they came in since it doesn't say their name. So I'm going to very quickly unmute all. If Pam can go ahead and start talking when that happens and if everyone else can put yourself back on mute, that would be fantastic. Okay, so everyone should be able to unmute themselves if Pam is muted, she should be able to unmute herself also. Hello, this is Pam. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> All right, so if you're not Pam, please put yourself back on mute. And Pam, do you want to um, introduce yourself and where you work and your role? Yes, I, I need to de-escalate myself just a minute. <laughs> um, uh, hi, everyone. I am uh, Pam Berry, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I practice in Hood River, Oregon, out in the beautiful Columbia Gorge. Um, I work at Providence Hood River Memorial Hospital, and particularly in the oncology and infusion clinic, um, mostly with uh, patients that experience cancer. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, and our hospital is a critical ac access hospital, so we have about 25 beds, so it's pretty small and pretty rural. Um, anything major ends up going to Portland. Um, so just a little background there. Um, and our social workers in our system out here number in the single digits. Um, okay. Is that where we're at, Susan? Are we up to me? Yes, we are. It's the first slide of your case example for Gary. Okay, perfect. So, pardon all the technology challenges. I'm going old school with a phone and a paper copy of the slide. So, um, so my example, um, well, first I just, I had a couple of comments that I was going to say in the beginning, um, but I really appreciated the last talk we had around social narratives. And I think that often comes up when we are faced with a crisis situation and the need for de-escalation um, and finding ways to pause and think about how those social narratives might be impacting our response or our perception of violence um, can be really important. Um, so I'm appreciating how everything is like kind of coming together in these talks. It's pretty awesome. Um, so my example is Gary. Um, he is 69 years old and he experiences Parkinson's disease. And he comes to our infusion center um, for a medication that he gets for that Parkinson's disease. Um, so he's not really like one of our oncology patients. Um, and he has a primary care doctor that's his primary um, physician. Um, he is a regular long-time patient, so the, the nurses know him pretty well. Um, and 
given our small town element, one of the nurses knows him um, on a personal level as well. Um, he had his, uh, his wife was um, diagnosed with an advanced cancer um, and she was his primary caregiver. Um, and his, I would say his uh, Parkinson's, uh, going back, his Parkinson's uh, symptoms were, he did, does have tremors um, and some mild to moderate dementia. Um, so he was somewhat dependent on his wife at times, although he was still driving himself. Um, he came to clinic and he expressed a lot of sadness and anger um, and his uh, favorite nurse uh, sat with him for quite a while and listened to what had happened. Um, he was pretty agitated and he was making verbal threats to our uh, CEO and CNO uh, by name. It's a small town, so we all know who those people are. Um, and he wanted to hold them accountable. Um, so I was asked to come and meet with him to try to intervene. The ones that put this whole thing together, they added 10,000. Much so, um, the can everybody else try and remember to mute themselves? Thank you. Um, so, I proceeded to do a lot of empathetic listening, uh, tried some basic de escalation. He seemed to calm slightly, and when he was done with his infusion, uh, said that he wanted to leave. Um, so, um, he uh, what he then, uh, I then walked him to the elevators and, um, you know, wished him well, and he was on his way. And about 15 minutes later, we heard a code gray being called. So, um, my question to you is, what do you do at that point? And maybe we can, people can respond in the chat. What, how would, what, would they respond? Would they not respond? Do we even know that it's scary? <laughs> Susan, are you able to monitor the chat? I am not when I'm sharing my screen. Samantha, can you help us monitor the chat? Yeah, sure. I can help you guys with that. That would be great. <laughs> Uh, so, can you clarify what a code gray means at our institution is the first question that came in. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, it just means that there's a potential for um, violence or an upset patient or staff member um, and that triggers um, security to respond and then any anybody who's a, you know, a behavioral health person or management would respond to that call. And the code gray, I'll specify, the code gray was in the lobby. The location was in the lobby of the main hospital. Any other questions so far or, or comments about what you might do? I don't see anything else popping into the chat yet. And Pam, do you want me to go to the next slide? Well, yeah, I just wanted to highlight, I, it's written here, but I didn't say it, but the reason why he was upset that day was because his wife had previously been admitted to our hospital in a medical crisis, um, and it rose to the level that she needed to be sent to Portland, and this happened in the middle of the night. Um, all the documentation says that he was communicated with regarding that um, need for her to take the helicopter to Portland, um, but he didn't recall this and he was very much upset and felt like decisions were being made without him. So from Andrea, we so, have, I think it would be helpful to go down to see who it is. If you are the person who helped previously de-escalate, then you might be able to do it again. And that is what I did. <laughs> so, ready, are you ready for the next slide, Pam? Yes, please. Thank you. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, in our small hospital, we have uh, we don't have like a behavioral health response team. Um, we have 
on staff at any one time, we have one to two security officers. Um, and so it's often left to, if there's a social worker nearby or, and or um, an, a nurse manager or a house supervisor, those are the people that typically respond. So myself and our clinic manager who also knew what was going on, we both um, took off from our offices and headed to the lobby. Um, and when we got there, the security officer had responded and the local, the closest RN manager um, from, I believe it was like our day surgery area, he had come out as, and they had um, proceeded to help uh, Gary move to a closer, uh, safer location in kind of this empty unit that was nearby. And so we approached and explained that we had been involved, we know him, um, and could we kind of take the lead um, from there? So we kind of got a handoff. Security stayed nearby, but at a distance at our request. Um, and then the nurse manager, she proceeded to do her awesome nursing stuff in that she said to him, you know, I'm really worried about your blood pressure. I'm worried about your breathing. Can we have you sit down and, and I can take your blood pressure and we can, you know, check to see how you're doing. Cause I'm really worried about you right now. Um, and he just, that just started to, um, calm things down. Um, and he did, he sat down, I offered him some water. Um, we listened a lot more, although we had already heard a lot of what he was concerned about. Um, I continued to reinforce and redirect his conversation um, to how much he loves and cares and is worried for his wife. Um, so I really wanted him to like shift from that anger um, to the scared and the worried. Um, which was underneath that anger for him. Um, we we didn't hurry. We spent a lot of time with him. We gave him a lot of space. We had many pauses. And during um, some of those pauses, he started to release his emotion. Um, he was uh, sighing um, and tearful at times. He started to kind of slump over in, in his chair, not in a scary, he's having an, a, you know, a medical crisis, but more of an emotional kind of, um, uh, I don't know, release or not really defeat, but just, you could just see him instead of being up and his, and his arms out and, you know, his posture changed, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, and then we worked with him to come up with a safety plan. Um, this time I walked him all the way to his car <laughs> and made sure he got into the car. Um, and we talked about who who he could call at home, who he might get some support from, how he might be able to get more information about what's going on with his wife. Um, and then after he left, um, I did call his um, one of his emergency contacts, which is a, his neighbor, and asked him if he would check on Gary when he got home. Um, and he said, great, he drives right past his house when he goes to his house. And the extra bonus was that he's a retired firefighter paramedic. So um, Fred was able to check on him and then Fred called me back later in the day and let me know how he was doing. Um, and then our nurse manager actually called his primary care doctor who was not part of our facility, um, is actually in another town and um, talked with the case manager there, uh, giving them an update and our concerns about Gary and, um, what's been going on with him and uh, him being able to, you know, continue to engage in his healthcare at our facility, given his very strong emotions around just being in that building. So next slide, please. Got it to takeaways. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I wrote some things down and I have a whole bunch of notes here, but I would love to hear from the chat and from the folks listening. What are some takeaways? What are some things that uh, we did well? What are some things that are unique to maybe our situation? What are some things that you would do differently? What are questions you have? Any feedback?
Samantha, is there anything in the chat? I don't have any. Oops. I don't have anybody who's added anything into the chat right this minute. Um, oh, here we go from Tara. I very much appreciate taking the time to actually be with Gary and listen to or listen and take the time to do this. Um, I realize that because most people are calling in, they don't have the option to write in the chat. Oh. So if someone right. does want to unmute themselves for a minute to share a thought, it, I don't know if you guys are okay with that as long as we don't have a whole bunch sure. of people at once. Sure. I think one thing that I thought of when you were talking about uh, your situation, Pam, because you're in such a rural small hospital, like that social work automatically goes to those where I think about bigger hospitals that like not every social worker in the hospital would it would be appropriate to like go to address that and like so just making sure that like within your institution you know kind of the protocol um and also then it makes me curious like is it always appro appropriate to put like certain people on like the front line of like if there's a safety concern does if that question makes sense Yeah, those are all great thoughts and we have definitely had a couple of situations in the last two years where those discussions have come up. Um, and I, I did push back on one because they wanted me to do a threat of violence assessment and I didn't feel safe doing that um, in another scenario. Um, so, yeah, it's tricky when your resources are limited and everyone wears multiple hats. And, and I would add that I think, you know, it's one of the things we're struggling with, even in an institution with a lot of resources that, you know, trying to figure out what constitutes a threat and um, depending on, on, on who one speaks with, we, uh, many of us have different thresholds of tolerance for, you know, how much we are willing to put ourselves, you know, on the front lines versus what are some of the other resources that we need to draw upon to ensure the safety for everybody. Pam, I also love that you wrote on this slide to try not to have a power struggle because I think that happens when, when people are upset. Yeah, so I didn't even address the situation that happened. I didn't confirm, deny anything. I was just focused on how much he cared about his wife and how worried he was for her because um, there was no point. I felt no, I, it was just going to get into the who did what kind of situation. Um, the other thing that was unique about this scenario was his medical condition and his, his tremors actually, I think, had some of us perceiving him as maybe more agitated than he was. When you see somebody kind of like shaking, you get the perception that like, whoa, they are really worked up, but that's kind of just him. So it was hard to, harder to assess, I think, like how agitated he was. Um, and then rationalizing with him. So the dementia piece, he was less likely or less able, partly because he was activated and partly because he, you know, has some cognitive impairment. So rationalizing with him wasn't gonna be um, very fruitful. Um, we, we did focus uh, on calming down his, you know, his autonomic uh, nervous system, sorry for that fumble. Um, with just attending to his basic needs to try and calm his system down so he could be able to, you know, walk out of there uh, safely um, and, you know, drive himself home. Um, and I, the biggest thing for me was that I, I wasn't alone. I had my nurse manager with me and I had security standing by. Um, so I wasn't doing it myself. I think that's a key thing. And I had the advantage that we knew the patient. I think that was huge um, so that we were able to know the backstory. And he had seen me before because several weeks before when his wife was diagnosed, they asked me to just meet with him and, and hear his story and, and um, see if there was anything I can do to help. Um, and so I did have some familiarity with him. So I do wonder what would have been different had it been, you know, security in the initial 
manager that responded? How would they have done that maybe differently than we did? Are there any other comments or the chat? Okay, want the next slide? Yes, please. Okay. So de-escalate. We all have probably had some kind of um, webinar training, something in regard to this. Um, it comes across many ways. People call it conflict resolution, conflict management, crisis resolution, talking someone down, um, crisis prevention, diffusing. Um, they all kind of come along on, under this larger heading of de-escalation. Um, the intention is to reduce the patient's agitation and aggression. And I would add also the activation of staff too, because the, the process can also help us be less activated in the situation. Um, and ways in which we do this are through communication, self-regulation, assessment, actions, safety maintenance to reduce the risk of harm. Um, I think about how they moved him into like an empty unit um, away from the lobby, away from um, other people and other things going on. Um, that was helpful. Next slide, please. Got it. De-escalation. Okay. So while no gold, gold standard exists, um, there's lots of different types of trainings and techniques and ideas. Um, they all kind of come to the same conclusion that de-escalation um, prevents violent behavior, um, helps us avoid more restrictive responses like restraint, um, can reduce patient anger and frustration, maintain safety for staff and patients, um, improve the relationships between staff and patients as well. Um, I think in the example of Gary, I mean, that was kind of a bonding or relationship building experience to help him through that um, really emotional time for him and to be able to care for him and help him through that. Um, enabling patients to manage their own emotions and regain that personal control. Um, helping patients develop feelings of hope, security, and self-acceptance. Other potential benefits? Absolutely increasing safety of the workforce, um, which is very important. And I think this one is one of my most important in my heart is the reduction of trauma and harm to the workforce because um, we talk so much about personal safety, but I think emotional safety is just as important um, and having a way in which we can de-escalate situations and resolve them as peacefully as possible um, is gonna reduce that trauma and harm. Um, it's going to potentially increase uh, staff engagement, you know, and job satisfaction. Um, and produce better care for our patients and greater patient satisfaction as well. So, hey. next slide, please. You got yep. it. There it is. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, how do we do this? Um, we kind of compiled a variety of like 10 tips on um, just some basics, but there's all kinds of different trainings from Crisis Prevention Institute or Critical Incident Response, um, but they all kind of have some shared elements that we kind of put together in this next section. Um, so I think the first thing to do when you're faced with a situation that feels like um, it's high, big emotions, feeling scary, potential for violence, any of those things, is a, a quick assessment of the situation. Pause, take a breath, um, and really ask yourself, like, are, do, you need, who do, you, do you need help and who do you need help from? Um, and that, I think, is really important because we can get ourselves into some scary situations um, by ourselves if we don't um, stop and ask for help if needed. Um, so the first tip we have here is, uh, remaining as empathetic and non-judgmental as possible. I think that's an area where we can think about um, those social narratives that we might have that kind of pop up or our own um, implicit bias. 
Um, it happens for all of us, um, and it can change our perception of um, that threat of violence. Um, listen carefully for feelings. Um, I think staying in that feeling realm um, and maybe not arguing the details or the facts of the situation that they're upset with um, can sometimes uh, help with that de-escalation. Um, showing them with your nonverbal, your body language, that you're engaged, you know, focusing on them, giving them your attention, um, how, you know, what's going on with your body? Are you making eye contact or you're nodding your head? Those kinds of things. Um, and restating and paraphrasing what the patient is saying to you so that they can clarify or they can um, know that you heard them. So reflecting back to them. And I think the other thing about doing that is it also kind of buys you a little bit of time sometimes to just kind of check in with your own self, your own body, and to regulate yourself um, in the situation when we can also get escalated. Pam, I was just listening to a physician uh, do that very thing with a patient that was upset this morning, and it was really helpful, really helpful. Okay, next, Absolutely. next slide. Tip two. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, personal space. So um, having a, what they call in some of the trainings a supportive stance, consider your position, like where you are in the room. Like, are you in front of the door so they don't have an exit? Um, are you uh, are you standing one to three feet away from them? What is their posture like? Um, are you standing with your you know your hands on your hips, um, your arms crossed? Um, uh, a lot of trainings recommend kind of a split stance with your legs a little more relaxed, um, and uh, be very careful of any kind of touch. Um, and explain your actions before you do them so that there aren't any surprises. And people who experience, um, have experienced a lot of trauma often um, can startle easily uh, and that can really escalate things. So being really careful about um, what you do. Um, I just asked a patient, what a husband the other day, because he ex disclosed that he experiences PTSD and I just asked him, you know, what are ways in which we can make sure that we don't Act, accidentally activate you while you're in clinic here. Um, and he gave me some suggestions, like don't come from behind, announce yourself when you come in the room, um, just various things like that. So um, those can be simple things that you can do that can be really effective. Next slide, please. Tip three. Tip three, allow time for decisions. Um, and I think this taking the time part is what um, I d didn't do in the beginning with Gary. Um, you know, I'm busy like everyone else, and you know, there, I'm sure there was some annoyance in my in my uh, the back of my head, like let's get this resolved and get Gary on his way so I can get back to my to do list because it's quite long. Um, so I definitely checked that. Uh, before I engaged him again after the code gray was called. And I knew I needed to really invest however long it needed to resolve the situation um, and put my to-do list to, to the side. Um, so give people time to, uh, to decide what to do, you know, when you're planning the next steps. Um, try not to pressure them. Um, it just is gonna make things more stressful. It's hard to do, though. It's easier said than done when we all are very busy. Um, tip number four, um, that non-threatening, uh, nonverbal uh, kind of a, a talked about earlier was your gestures, your facial expressions, your movements, your tone of voice. And the tone of voice can be so important. Um, and think about, like, where you're also standing. I didn't think about that. Like, um, I definitely sat down. Once he sat down, I sat down with him, so I wasn't standing over him. Um, and kind of leaned in a little bit um, with keeping some space, but just a little more relaxed and, and thoughtful about how I was um, moving my body near him. Um, and then tip number five, this one can be real tricky, um, setting limits. Um, you know, I think the um, first uh, presenter talked about this as well, about, you know, if this happens, if you continue to do this, I'm gonna need to leave the room. Um, statements that can be really helpful are, are these when-then statements, 
Like when you say those things, like it's a threatening language, then the staff feel scared or worried that you might hurt someone. Um, and sometimes that can be really eye-opening because they are very in, in somebody can be very um, focused on their anger and they're upset and not realizing how they're being perceived by other people. So cluing them in, like when you do these things, the people around you, the staff around you, they're getting scared and they're really worried. And, and that can sometimes go, oh, that wasn't my intention. I didn't really want to scare people. I'm just really, really angry. Um, also, Pam, I, tr out I tried that. Go ahead, please. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you have an example? Oh, I was just going to say, I did that with a patient a, a year ago who was a long trauma history and was really um, agitated and the staff were really afraid. And when I used the when then with him, physically, emotionally, he completely changed and said, I'm not trying to frighten anybody. And it, it was a, a turning point. It was really important. Yeah. Yeah, helping them understand, like, when you're pacing back and forth, that, you know, that can scare people and be intimidating. Um, yeah. So, focusing on the feelings, um, something that a term I, or a phrase I often use with kids is name it to tame it. Um, but really labeling the feelings that you're witnessing, the fear, the sadness, or grief, um, loss of control, um, those kinds of things, naming them. Um, and offering support around those feelings um, can be really important because then the person may feel that they're really being heard and that may really calm things down. Um, tip number seven, ignore challenging questions. And that's that power struggle piece um, that we, it's so easy to get stuck in. Uh, when, when someone challenges your authority or um, the authority of the facility, you can try to redirect them to the, the current issue. Um, let's see, managing the power struggle is critical to your own mental health as well. Um, and I thought about one thing that came up when I was listening to some of the other speakers was, um, that narrative about the medical team knowing what's best um, versus the patient. And I think that's sometimes the power struggle that we can get in and that like, well, we're the medical team and we know what needs to happen here. Um, and so um, getting into the power struggle of like, here are the things in which you need to do, but maybe once we deescalate and talk to the patient, maybe there's something else that can be, can be done to resolve the situation. Um, Next slide, please. You got it. Avoid tip eight. Tip eight, avoid overreacting. Uh, easier said than done as well. Um, while we can't control the patient, we can control how we respond. So trying to remain calm, uh, rational and professional uh, will really help the situation. Um, you know, not always, we can't always, uh, affect the situation by that, but it sure can help ourselves stay calm and centered and less reactive in the situation and hopefully um, invite the person that's upset to join us in more of a calm, rational state. So taking deep breaths, remembering that those distressed behaviors are often rooted in fear, anxiety, sadness, grief, um, taking that moment you know, like we were saying, buy yourself a little time with reflecting um, and then reiterate what the patient's saying. Um, and I always try to assume good intentions that they're, they're most likely not here to hurt someone, although that could happen. Um, but uh, most likely they have good intentions. Uh, that's just my personal preference. Um, and then, uh, I wrote myself a note here because I think the use of security um, is key with um, avoiding overreacting. And that's a tough call um, on how to use security. I, I felt really comfortable having security in my scenario nearby um, and also asked them to not really be in the line of sight of the patient. 
um, because I didn't want security to be activating for him. Um, so that's a really hard decision, I think, for security. And you may not be on the same page as security is as well on how to respond in those scenarios. So I think those are sometimes the um, tricky spots to be in is to decide how, do you, how and when to use um, security. Okay, next slide. You got it, tip nine. Choose what you insist upon wisely. So be thoughtful in deciding what rules are negotiable and which are not. Um, options and flexibility can help you avoid unnecessary confrontations. Um, you know, where can you make some accommodations for this patient given the situation now that you maybe have more information? And where are the places where you have to really hold the line and set a boundary um, with someone? And recognizing that situations evolve, so changes may need to be made as you go along and more information is is discovered and relationships are built and maybe maybe some things can change. Um, but also knowing where you have to hold the line and, and how to do that um, effectively. Um, tip number 10, um, allow silence for reflection. Um, sometimes it's difficult to do that. Um, and silence can be the best option in allowing you and the patient to reflect on what's happening and how to proceed next. Um, that was really helpful with Gary as well as the emotions started to flow, giving some pause for those emotions to kind of flow through him. Um, and then um, taking some time to reflect on what had happened and coming up with a safety plan for him. Okay, I think, um, do we wanna pause for any thoughts? Sure. Discussion around those tips and techniques. I think when you're when you're responding in a team, knowing everyone's strengths can be helpful and utilizing those strengths. In my situation, I definitely utilize the nurse's strengths on like taking care of his physical needs and then my strengths on taking care of the emotional needs. Does anyone want to come uh, can people come off mute and say anything? And as we pause right here real quick, I just want to give an update that we're at the six minute mark for um, the breakout session. Great. Thank you. Maybe Susan, do you want to move forward then? Sure, let's go ahead and do that. So I think I, as Pam said, these are complicated situations and not one size is ever going to fit all of our situations. And I think as Pam has mentioned, it, it really, is a team sport. Um, so I think the, the, the three things I was thinking about as we were preparing this talk was how do we keep patients at the center of our approach? That's why we're here. We're here to take care of patients and we want them to be at, at the centerpiece. At the same time, we also want to take care of our staff. We need to take care of the workforce and keep them safe as well. And sometimes sometimes it's tough a tough call to know where that lands. And then finally, um, our health systems, you know, again, we aren't always very trauma informed. They're slow to change um, and it's fairly rigid in, in our approaches. And so I think we're, we're at a point in our evolution as healthcare providers of really needing to see our systems evolve and change with us uh, during these complex times. And then finally, as I said, I think that these are really complex issues. And um, Pam and I have talked a lot about the need to have grace for ourselves and one another in these difficult situations because they do evolve. No one approach will fit all situations. And some staff members will be more prepared than others to, to navigate or manage these situations depending on their clinical skills, but also depending on whether or not they have a relationship uh, with the patient. Uh, so with that, I want to say thank you to each one of you for being here today and for all that you do every day to take care of our patients and one another and um, ask if there are any final, final words of wisdom from anyone or final questions. Tara said, thank you, Tara, that she found these very helpful. And I'm going to um, 
also just say thank you for bearing with our technology cha challenges today. And thank you, Samantha, for navigating all of this with us. Thank you to my co-presenter, Pam. And um, I guess with that, we'll end our session. Thank Thanks you.